Christ is risen. Alleluia. Today we celebrate the good news of the resurrection. I am Elizabeth Lovell Milford, pastor of Heritage Presbyterian Church in Ackworth, Georgia. Welcome to our virtual worship service for Easter Sunday, April 4th, 2021. We're glad you've connected with us, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, and hope that you will let us know of your presence with us by leaving us a comment or emailing us at office at heritagepress.com. You can learn more about how to get involved with our ministries, either virtually or in person, by visiting our website, heritagepress.com, or following us on Facebook. Today, we are happy to connect to a larger faith family with our siblings in Christ around our denomination as we share in the Easter service from the Presbyterian Church USA. It was led by many of our denomination staff serving in Louisville, Kentucky, and features a sermon by the Reverend Dr. Diane Gibbons Moffat, President and Executive Director of the Presbyterian Mission Agency. This service does include the celebration of the Lord's Supper, and you are invited to participate in this feast during the service using any bread that you have and cup of the vine you have to share, trusting that Christ will make it holy. Come, let us share in the good news we have received, in which we stand and by which we are saved, for Christ is risen indeed. Greetings in the name of the Lord on this sacred day, this holy day, this powerful day in which the Lord has risen and which we celebrate the power of the Lord in our life day by day. What a great moment for us to be able to celebrate, celebrate the joy and the power that comes from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for one more time. One more time to celebrate the fact that you are not dead, you are alive. You're alive in the power of Jesus. You're alive in the power of the Holy Spirit. You are alive in a God who many times we do not see, but we know that you are there. You are alive, clothed in so many different ways people who have touched our lives, parents who have loved us, individuals who have given us a word of wisdom and we did not even know their name. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for being in the midst of us and keeping us through all of the vicissitudes of life. You have been our God. You've seen us through. And to prove that you can do all things but fail, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, through the, life, death, through the life, death, and burial of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we've come to discover more than we ever knew and to love you more than we ever thought we could. Let us worship God today in spirit and in truth. Let us be reminded that everything we have is yours. And let us never forever forget the great story of Easter that reminds us that you live, and because you live, we can live also. Amen and amen.
Aleluya, Cristo ha resucitado. En verdad, Cristo ha resucitado. Aleluya. 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 Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Spirit of God helps us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We ignore the cries of the oppressed and are indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy, Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new. That we may know the joy of life abundant, given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Hear the good news of God's promise. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. 
enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit, so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Greetings. The scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter, verses 1 to 8. And it reads as follows. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A joyous resurrection day to all of you. It's an honor for me to bring this Easter message to you. Though we are not able to gather in person as we once did, the gift of technology allows us to worship, work, and serve the people of God. And thankfully, the rage of the COVID-19 virus is beginning to be tamed by the creation and administration of new vaccines. We still have mountains to climb and valleys to forge in this pandemic, but the hope of returning to in-person worship and fellowship is closer than before. And I'm grateful to God for every church, presbytery, synod, and believer in this season who has persevered in ministry, bringing good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed, and sharing the love, justice, and peace of Jesus Christ with others. Though church buildings may be closed, the church remains open because like Mary Magdalene, Mary, and Salome in our scripture today, we are the church, the ecclesia, those who are called out and appointed to bear witness to Jesus Christ. Now as wonderful as bearing witness to the risen Christ may be, this call can also be frightening. It beckons us to make a wild claim. It pushes us to work in risky ways. It demands a high investment with no guarantee of earthly success. I recall the words of the African-American hymn, Were You There? The last stanza says, were you there when he rose up from the tomb? Oh, oh, oh. sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. This is certainly the case with the women in our scripture today. When we meet them, they are fresh in the throes of grief. They have come to anoint the dead body of Jesus and bury the hope he brought to them while he was on earth. They were strong supporters of this Jesus movement. They were people of the way, people who believed in new possibilities that salvation and liberation for God's people would not be preserved for the sweet by and by, but would happen on earth right here, right now. But their hopes were hushed by the tragic murder of their master and friend. Instead of being an earthly king, Jesus becomes a crucified savior. His death is devastating. His disciples scatter in fear. These devoted sisters are left with nothing more to give than to prepare the body of Jesus for his final earthly resting place. 
Scripture tells us they arrive at the tomb on the first day of the week, early in the morning, at the crack of dawn, while the dew is still on the roses. Silence is the music in the air. Sorrow is a song in their hearts. Who will, wait, who will roll away the stone is the question in their minds. They expect to find no one there. So the women are shocked when they arrive and they see that the stone has already been rolled away, allowing easy access to the sacred space. Quietly and cautiously, they step inside the grave only to encounter another shock. A young man, they say a little child shall lead them, whose presence and pronouncement startles them. Dressed in a long white robe, he tells the ter terrified trio, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women go out and flee from the tomb. They say nothing to no one because they are scared. The Greek word for scared is thabeo, from which we get the word phobia. It is an interesting choice in this verse of scripture. Scared, according to one concordance, means fearing to do something for fear of harm, which tells me that the women are scared because they fear the harm that may come to them, considering what they have seen and been told to do. You see, bearing witness can be frightening because it beckons us to make a wild claim. If someone were to come to us, Speaking about a young man dressed in a white robe who shows up at a sunrise service for the dead, we may question their state of mind. If we were to hear a friend invite us to go and meet a mutual friend who they claim rose from the dead, but whom we know was dead and buried, we might recommend a good therapist. Women in Jesus' time, and in too many cases today, were low on the social ladder of life. Their testimony needed affirmation by at least two male witnesses. Could these ladies get the votes? The claim of the risen Christ can taint the reputation and color the character of those who confess it. In fact, in one of his stirring sermons, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, Pastor Emeritus of the Trinity United Church in Chicago, tells a story about some black seminarians who were in a seminar being taught by a professor who was challenging the students on the reality of the resurrection and a resuscitated corpse. For fear of harming their reputation of, and risk of being labeled as simple, the young seminarians held their tongue and listened intently to what the professor was saying. And so as with most seminars, there was a break and and they were talking about all of this with one another. And one particular seminarian was stirred up by the sidebar conversation and, and feeling like he needed to say what he really believed, got up the nerve to challenge the professor. He was eating an apple and he used it as an illustration. He said, Professor Crunch, with all due respect, can you tell me if the apple I'm eating is tart or sweet? And he took another bite, crunch. The professor answered, no. The student said, why? The professor said, because I haven't tasted it. The student said, neither have you tasted my Jesus. That young seminarian went on to bear witness to the resurrection, which was as real to him as the apple in his hand. But you see, at this point in the journey, as we go back to our story, the women are too startled and scared to do what that seminarian did. They are told about what happened to Jesus. The apple is in their hand, but they need time to eat it, to process what is happening. They run from the tomb and the task laid before them, perhaps because it is pushing them faster than they can go right now, and they know the risk that comes with following Jesus and making such a claim. Bearing witness can be frightening because it can take us to risky places and spaces. Back in 2017, I ran for the mayor of the city of Greensboro, where I was serving in a church, St. James Presbyterian Church, North Carolina. Now, running for mayor was certainly not on my bucket list. But a trusted group of faith leaders pulled me aside and they asked if I would prayerfully consider doing so. 
They wanted someone who would lift up the issues faced by too many black indigenous people of color in the city. Poverty, unemployment, the needs of uh, more jobs that paid a living wage and the unjust treatment of black and brown police people in the police department were on the agenda. And like most cities, Greensboro is divided across race and economic lines. Money was being poured into the development of the downtown district with little attention paid to the adjoining neighborhoods of color in the area. My friends wanted a candidate who would be able to garner support from citizens of every hue in Greensboro so that the quality of life for everyone living there could become a reality. Well, after much prayer, consultation with the St. James Session and congregation, where I was serving as pastor, as I said, and no small discussion with my family, I decided to accept the call to run for mayor. And the Moffitt for Mayor movement began. And oh, what a time it was. Selecting a campaign manager and staff, lawn signs, slogans, stomp speeches, fundraisers, neighborhood canvassing, appearances at debate after debate after debate, great press coverage, not so great press coverage, attacks, affirmations, encouragement, critiques. It was an intense time. At risk was my reputation and even the reputation of the church. There were candidates in the primary, four of them, and I had never run for office, but as it turns out, I garnered enough votes to push out the competition and win the primary so that I would face the incumbent mayor in the fall of 2017. Well, the election came and the election went and I lost with no major blunders, thank God. Well, I would not take anything for the journey when the news came that I had lost, I was ready to gather all my signs, shut down my Facebook account, close my campaign bank account, turn off the operation cell phone, and move on. The ups and downs, the pain and praise, the persecution and the problems make this a risky endeavor. And when it was over, I was done. I wonder if the women feel this way too about their involvement with Jesus' movement and mission. Bearing witness can be frightening because it demands a lot of you, a high investment with no guarantee of earthly success. These three women pour their heart and soul into Jesus' life and ministry only to end up seeing him die on a cross. Now, if what the young men they met in the grave said is true, it means that the Jesus movement is not over, however, which also means their work is not done. There's no shutting down the operation, dispersing the materials, or dismantling the spiritual enterprise. Could the return to Galilee indicate Jesus movement continues? And who will take it up? Oh yes, Galilee is the place where Jesus' ministry and movement all started. And to be sure, wonderful things happened in the movement. Wonderful things happened in Galilee. In Galilee, you will recall, Jesus preaches his first sermon. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Galilee is where he calls his first disciples, Simon and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John. Galilee is where Jesus performs his first exorcism, causing an unclean spirit to come out of a man at a Capernaum synagogue. In Galilee, Jesus takes the hand of Simon Peter's sick mother-in-law and lifts her from her bed and from her fever. The news about Jesus first spreads in Galilee. Jesus travels throughout the region, preaching to the crowds, teaching in the synagogues, liberating lepers, curing paralysis, restoring shriveled hands, making a dead girl rise again. Thrones of people flock to Jesus in Galilee, where he is known for making miracles happen at his tent revivals, preaching and teaching without a praise team, mood lights, and high-tech projectors. But Galilee, is also the cause for Jesus' death. His principles and powers, his teaching and preaching, his healing ministry and saving grace leads Jesus into direct confrontation with the authorities. He is a threat to the status quo and authoritative powers, and when he goes to Jerusalem, he is crucified, a Roman sedition. It's a painful ending to his earthly ministry. 
Now the women are being asked to bear witness to the resurrection and go to meet Jesus in Galilee, along with the disciples. Will the movement continue? And if so, how will it end for them? If the ministry and mission continues, they know it's going to cost them dearly and require an intense commitment. This is a lot for three sisters to com contemplate. They have not had time to grieve Jesus' death, let alone bear witness to his resurrection. But this is what they're asked to do. And it's also what we are asked to do. Many of you know that our denomination is striving to be a Matthew 25 church. It is a general assembly mandate. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, you know the story of the sheep and the goats. It's the biblical, theological, and ecclesial basis for our mission work plan to build congregational vitality, eradicate systemic poverty, and dismantle structural racism. When I think about it, back in 2008, when President Barack Obama was elected, people claimed we were living in a post-racial society. The January attack of the state capitol, the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and racism, and the uprising and protests sparked by the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery reveal there is still much work to be done, and Matthew 25 is applicable for the moment. In Matthew 25, Jesus shares what he expects of all the nations, rich and poor nations, powerful and poverty-stricken nations, strong and weak nations. All nations will be judged by how they respond to the least cared for, the least cherished, the least valued by the empire, the least of these who are deeply loved by God. Jesus dwells in them. He's on the side of the oppressed. So while some may be silent, in Matthew 25, we hear the call of Jesus to speak to the issues of racism and poverty, to do justice and respond with compassion to those who dwell on the margins of society. This is the work of the believer. This is the work of the church. Having lived during the Roman occupation, Jesus knows the importance of this work. He's aware of the violence done when one group of people dominates over another because of race or other discriminatory practices that press them into poverty and pushes them to the edge of their humanity. Jesus has something to say about nations whose social constructs are designed to benefit and privilege the few over and against the many. In the end, he will gather the nations and render his verdict, which will not be based on our creeds and confessions, but on the nation's commitment and response to the least of these. The sheep who have served the least of these will be rewarded. The goats will suffer severe punishment, eternal fire, and fellowship with the devil and his angels. Hmm. Friends, Jesus' resurrection is a mark in the sand, a declaration to the empire, that truth crust to the ground will rise again. It signals a continuation of his ministry by vital congregations, disciples who are committed to telling the world who believe Caesar is Lord, money is master, and power is king, that God is still large and in charge. It takes a great investment and commitment to do this work of ministry, and the, turns, the returns are not always so good. Because while Jesus' message is good news to the poor, it's not good news to those who try to kill him. It's not good news for those who benefit from the status quo. They will resent you for doing the work and getting involved in the issues of our time. The truth is the same forces that came for Jesus will come for those who follow in his footsteps. For a student is not above their teacher. God's word comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. Sometimes it causes me to tremble. Mark concludes this account of the resurrection with the women running from the grave. They leave and say nothing to no one. 
And while this is the end of Mark's story, it's just the beginning of the gospel because somewhere along the way, the women meet the risen Christ. And somewhere along the way, the disciples see the resurrected Lord and they tell the story. They pass it down so that somewhere along the way, we've heard the story and it resonates with us. And I'm grateful today for the story and for those churches and disciples and people who are embracing the story and doing the work. I'm grateful for God's resurrection power. I see it in nature when winter turns into spring and green grass sprouts and little red flowers blossom. I see it when caterpillars turn into butterflies and sleeping bears rise from hibernation. I see it in nature and I see it in my life. I'm grateful for God's call to serve God's people and for God's love and mercy that moves me from fear to faith and makes me sing with boldness and and sincerity, the words of that Easter hymn, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever people say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along the narrow way. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. I have found that it is wrestling with this call and, and seeing glimpses of resurrection in our life that moves us from fear to boldly bearing witness to Christ and doing the work that we're called to do in a world that needs to know the rising power of Jesus. And so I leave you with the words of Amanda Gorman, that young African-American youth that, that was the first ever, she's the first ever youth poet laureate who recited that powerful poem at the inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. In the closing stanza, she writes, when day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there's always light. If only we're brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. May we step out of the shade, even our fears, and be witnesses to the risen Christ this Easter Sunday, today, and always. Amen. Hallelujah, Jidu Yi Fu Huo, Zu Yi Chong Si Li Fu Huo, Hallelujah.
on this day of resurrection, we gather at the Lord's table. We know the fear of the upper room. We know the feeling of hard days and long nights. We know the grief of the tomb and the particular ache of saying goodbye. We know the pain of Good Friday and the darkness before the dawn. And still, and still, we believe. Again and again, the sun does rise. Again and again, God draws near. Again and again, the tomb will be empty. Again and again, love will win. Again and again, God will lead the church. Again and again, again and again, we will be loved. The journey will not be perfect, but again and again, the sun will rise. Here at this table, we dare to profess such a faith again and again. And here is where we meet our risen Lord. So come, let us share in the feast, for Christ has prepared the way, and all are invited. Let us pray. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. In every time and in every age, O oh God, it is right to give you thanks. For your mercy is sure and your steadfast love endures forever. We rejoice that your faithfulness is as sure as the rising of the sun. And that even when people have broken your covenant, your light breaks over the horizon and illuminates us in love. You are holy, Lord, and heaven and earth are full of your glory. Again and again we join the refrain, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Today we give you thanks that you sent us a Savior. Christ invites us into a deeper relationship with you, meeting us where we are and promising a new and abundant life. In love, Jesus calls us to listen, to learn, and shows us a better way. He reforms our understandings. He helps us draw on courage to seek your kingdom. Again and again, we find ourselves here with your story surrounding us. And remembering our Lord's self-giving love, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come now, O Prince of Peace, spirit of love, breath of life. Give us words where we have none. Fill us with vision when we have the most need. Give us a voice to proclaim our faith in every hour. And as we share in bread and cup, hold us together even from a distance. Make us one with Christ and all who share in this meal. Give us a glimpse of the glory you have prepared that we may be strengthened in our faith here and now. We offer ourselves to you in gratitude for this great day of resurrection, praising you in the name of the one crucified and risen, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At his last meal with his disciples, on the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. He gave thanks to God and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. 
And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and giving thanks to God said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. Come, come. Let us share in this feast. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Alléluia, le Christ est ressuscité, le Seigneur est vraiment ressuscité. Alléluia. Together, life during COVID has been challenging. That feels like an understatement, right? At times, we've all felt disconnected, confined, missing family, missing our friends, lonely, worried about if the groceries are going to hold out, and unsure of what the future may hold. Imagine feeling all of those things, but living in a place or in a situation that was already challenging each and every day without the added pressure of a pandemic. A place where access to food is day to day, access to vital health care is questionable. Finding clean water is a daily struggle. A place where you're denied racial justice or plagued with outright violence and oppression. But one thing remains steadfast and true. We are the church together, no matter where we are, and the church belongs with those struggling for justice, righteousness, and peace for life. Because food is life. Gifts to one great hour of sharing are helping the people of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota through a partnership with Owe Aku, a grassroots nonprofit organization that puts people in charge of their own food supply, nutrition, health, and well-being by reclaiming ancestral wisdom and teaching Lakota history and culture. The Pine Ridge Reservation is a food desert located in a county that has the lowest per capita income in the nation. The pandemic has dramatically amplified the desperate need for food security. Because water is life, gifts to one great hour of sharing are helping the families of Capirandita in a remote area of Bolivia face a more hopeful future 
by building infrastructure to address the community's critical water shortage. Their goal is to create 500 meters of pipes to transport safe well water to those in need. One great hour of sharing gifts will also support the distribution of plastic containers to collect and save rainwater. Because survivors are key to shaping lives focused on justice for all, gifts to one great hour of sharing are helping Black Women's Blueprint in its mission to take action on social justice issues and to deliver educational resources and support services to women, including those who have suffered sexual and other forms of abuse. Their work seeks to address the unique struggles of black women and girls within the context of the larger racial justice concerns. They're not just addressing issues of trauma, but they're also providing things like food and housing assistance that people need in order to be whole. The special offerings of PCUSA, including One Great Hour of Sharing, offer the whole church a way to embody Matthew 25 through the spirit-inspired stories and gifts that place us in service and partnership with those who have least. Our gifts directly support people experiencing hunger, homelessness, thirst, imprisonment, sickness, and deprivation, as well as welcoming the stranger. Our One Great Hour of Sharing is the largest way the Presbyterians come together in mission and ministry with those whom we see are in need. Because we are the church together, we can give to one great hour of sharing because of where the church belongs, of who the church is. Please give generously so that our church will continue to become, as Isaiah said, repairers of the breach. And as we always say, when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. God of life be with us. May we see you in the lives of all we meet and may we offer ourselves in kindness and kinship to all those in need, amen.
Aleluia! Cristo ressuscitou. Sim, o Senhor ressuscitou. Aleluia! Aleluia. Qam al-Messia. Ar-Rabbu haqqan qam. Aleluia! Aleluia, Kristu na vuka, infumu na vuka, chachine, aleluia. My friends, go out into the world bearing witness to the risen Christ. Go out into the world knowing that God is yet healing us, holding us, and keeping us, that we might do the work we've been called out to do. And may the good Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord God cause God's face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up God's countenance and be gracious unto you, giving you peace poise, and resurrection power, today, always, and forever. Hallelujah! Jesus is risen.